Okay, I, I just want to start off by saying thank you to the NSCA for having me here. Uh, it really is uh, like my pleasure to be here speaking to you guys. As Jason said, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for years. I, the only reason I got into the research world was to help influence practice. I had a lot of questions myself as a coach, and you know I wanted to really give back help to push this whole uh, industry forward. And so it's it's inspiring for me to be in you know this type of setting with guys like you. So, uh, without further ado, this is the, the demands of firefighting. You know, whether it's police, military, the environment is often extremely chaotic, unpredictable, and so this is really what we're preparing these individuals for, which can be very, very difficult because unlike other industries where we can really predict what the demands are, oftentimes we have no idea. And so we're really prepar preparing for something that we can't necessarily put a number to, which makes it, it challenging as a strength and conditioning professional. And because of this, which is, it's fa been fantastic, but um, a lot of the efforts are made towards fitness and exercise and being better prepared, getting healthy. And so we have situations where fire departments, military personnel, police, you know, do engage in activities like this, but in doing so, um, the evidence is now suggesting that a lot of the injuries being sustained by these populations actually happen during training, which is it's a bit of a catch-22. So we're trying to become better prepared for the demands of our job or our lives, and in doing so, we're actually hurting ourselves. And a recent study was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, just last year that came out, epidemiological survey, and they found that in, uh, in the fire department, I think it was Tucson, that the majority of their injuries were actually sustained while training or during exercise related activities. There's been a more recent study come out and they found that um, less fit individuals sustain more injuries, but exercise was one of the primary reasons why people got injured. And so it's even more of a problem. So we're saying that we need people, we need our, our firefighters, military, police to be very physically fit but the means by which they get there is actually hurting them. And so we're kind of stuck, you know, between a rock and a hard place here. It's like, what do we do? Is there something that we are doing that we shouldn't be doing? Or is there something that we should be doing that we aren't doing? So this has kind of been the, the area of my research for the past little while. So coming from a strength and conditioning background, I thought there's a huge value to exercise. There has to be. So we all know that. And so maybe we can look at it a little bit differently. So it's, if we understand what injuries are happening and what are the mechanisms for those injuries, why are they happening? If we can understand that, then maybe we could be make better science-based recommendations for training because exercise isn't just exercise. It, it can be very different. depends on how you do it. So about uh, probably five years ago now, um, <laughs> we had the pleasure of having a guy up in, in our lab when I was at Waterloo. And he was very ambitious, was willing to do anything that we wanted him to try in terms of exercises. And so we got him to do something like this. One of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life in person, as you can probably see by my face. Um, he lifted 315 pounds off the ground with his elbow. So those of you who have heard of a, a Zercher squat, this is a Zercher deadlift. Has anybody ever seen anybody do this before? Yeah. Incredibly impressive from a physical <coughs> strength perspective, but incredibly harmful at the same time. And so you can see that we've, uh, there we are. So we can see all the, we've instrumented this guy. So we can actually, we were measuring his motion, measuring the, what his muscles were doing as he was doing this. And I can tell you that before he did all this, we had him bend over, you know, just kind of touch his toes see how much range of motion he has in his back. And so we found that, you know, passive flexion, he's got about 40, 50 degrees. When he's loaded with 315 pounds while doing this exercise, he went up to 80. And so from an injury standpoint, that's incredibly high risk. Okay, so in that, in that kind of situation, when you're flex that much, your muscles can no longer work the way they're supposed to. And so what's, what's contributing? Well, it's your passive tissues, it's your ligaments, it's your discs. 
the things that we really don't want to load. They're only there as a, a safety mechanism. Those are the things that get damaged. So when we're talking about injury, typically that's, those are the tissues that become injured. And so if we have people trying to become more fit, doing things like this, using these type of movement patterns, they're going to get hurt in the process, or they're not actually going to become better prepared for what we're trying to accomplish. And so on that, um, I think it's good to, to really define what we mean by injury. And so oftentimes we throw around just, you know, people get injured, we don't really know, it's fatigue, it's, you know, lack of strength. If we don't have a clear definition of what we're talking about uh, for injury, then it becomes very difficult to make recommendations. So from a mechanical standpoint, injuries really occur when the applied load or the load being applied to a tissue exceeds the tissue's capacity to bear load. Okay, so it's demands, it's capacity. When demands exceed capacity, tissues fail. Okay, you can think about any type of material. You take a coat hanger and you bend it. When you've applied a load that exceeds the coat hanger's capacity or tolerance, it breaks. Our tissues work the exact same way. Okay, so in this picture here, I've got a definition of an acute injury. So we can see this dotted line at the top is the failure tolerance of a tissue. This dotted line is the applied load. The difference between those two is a margin of safety. So I have to maintain a margin of safety if I don't want injuries to happen. So in situations where you lift up something really, really heavy, you fall off a roof, you fall off a ladder, you break your arm, there's a fracture, that's when the applied load exceeded the tissue's tolerance in, the, in an instant. Okay, so there was a load applied really, really high, and at that instant, it exceeded the, the tissue's capacity to bear load, so that the tissue failed. But that's not the only type of injuries we're dealing with. And the reality is, in most cases, it's not acute. It's going to be a cumulative or a chronic exposure to an, a load that degrades the capacity or the tolerance of those tissues. Um, but just on this again, just so you, I have some evidence to support what I'm saying, if we take the back, for example, um, not only, so if I bend over, like the guy in that previous picture, and I flex my, my spine, not only am I putting my passive tissues at greater risk because I'm increasing the load that's applied to them, but I've changed the orientation of the, the muscles in my back. So if I bend over, typically, gravity is trying to pull my upper body or shear my upper body on my pelvis. And so what opposes that is the muscles of my back. They pull me back this way to prevent that from happening. But if I round my back or flex my spine like this, what happens to those muscles is they no longer act at an angle. They run right along my spine. And so there's nothing actually supporting me from gravity anymore. And so you can see this from ultrasound. And so in this picture here, when the person is, has a neutral spine, the muscle fibers are oriented in kind of a, an oblique angle, and so they can support or oppose gravity. When I round my back, now they run parallel to my back. Okay? So a flexed spine posture actually changes the orientation of my muscles, thereby placing more load or demanding more load or contribution from my ligaments and my discs. Okay, the other thing is when my spine is flexed, it becomes very weak. So if I'm neutral, and I've, I was working in a lab, and we had a, it was a great environment because we actually had real spines that we bent and twisted and loaded to see what type of loads actually break spines. What type of loads or motions does it take to herniate a disc? And so we could actually measure this stuff, and we found that if you're neutral, your spine can bear lots and lots and lots of load. But the second you deviate a little bit, it becomes very fragile and can break. And so not only do the muscles not support it the way they did when it was neutral, but now its capacity to bear load just as a structure goes way, way down. So it's a recipe for disaster. But, all right, so on this, we can see that both these postures are not the same. So although the external load is the same in both cases, the internal load or the risk of injury is very different. 
oftentimes we hear lift with our legs and not with our back. Which of these pitchers do you guys think is lifting with his legs and not with his back? Is there any, are either of these individuals lifting with their legs and not with their back? Is it possible not to lift with your back? No. You're always going to be lifting with your back. Your back is always going to work. But you can modify your spine angle or your spine posture to change the contribution of muscles, ligaments, discs, those type of things. So from a risk standpoint, the guy on the left is at a much greater risk because he's adopted a flexed spine posture. Okay. So this, that was kind of an acute sense and looking at a back example. The same thing is true for knees. So individual on the, the left here, knees deviated medially. Guy on the right, same kind of thing. So oftentimes, this is running. For firefighters, think about getting off a truck. So acutely, the demands of that task might not seem too, too bad. And so you get off a truck, you know, once with your knee falling in, not so bad, no injury. Two years, five years down the road, all of a sudden, something snaps and it breaks. And so you think, okay, well, this task, it couldn't have been the way I was doing it, it couldn't have been the task because I've been doing it for years like this. But we have to think about things from a chronic or cumulative standpoint. What, what are the implications that have been building over time? And so think back to the coat hanger example that I mentioned. When you first bend a wire coat hanger, does it break? No. Maybe not two times, maybe not three times, maybe not even four times. But eventually, it's going to break. How come? Because you've been applying loads and gradually, the tolerance or the capacity of that wire coat hanger has been degraded. So eventually, you've applied a load that was seemingly very, very low, but was sufficient to cause damage or cause the, the, the coat hanger to break because its capacity had dropped so much. Our body is the same way. And so you perform a task with your knee collapsing in the frontal plane like that so many times, eventually it's going to break. Okay, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. Eventually, it will. The, capa the, the capacity of those tissues are being degraded. And so this is what that definition kind of looks like. So we have an applied load. It wasn't sufficient to break that tissue initially, but over time, with repeated exposures, the tolerance of that tissue is going down. So eventually, a seemingly mundane task, like picking up something or tying your shoe, just bending over, getting off a truck, is enough to cause injury. Does that make sense? And so just some evidence to support this too. So uh, Tim Hewitt's group has done a lot of great work looking at ACL injuries and mechanisms. And frontal plane knee motion is one of the, the great causes of that. Um, and so you can think about another example that might, you might be able to relate to is runners with knee pain. How many people know somebody or have experienced issues or pain in their knee when they're running? Okay, some people in here. A lot of people contrib attribute it to the running, but don't necessarily ask the question, why does it only bother me on one side? Where was the other knee the whole time? It was going through the same exposures. And so it's probably more how you're running and not the running. Okay, don't blame the, the exercise. Blame how you're doing it. Because movement really does matter. I love this picture. So from a cumulative standpoint or a chronic standpoint, it's not just repetition. It could be exposures that we try and maintain for long periods of time. So from the fire service, we all know that part of the job is very sedentary. And so it's a lot of sitting. And so what are the implications of sitting for extended periods of time? And then being asked to jump up really, really quickly and go to the demands of a call. Because if we have sat for an extended period of time, we've also potentially degraded the tissue's tolerance. Have you guys heard of creep? So your ligaments creep. 
And so over time, just by sitting for long, extended periods, we might actually be degrading the tolerance of those tissues so that a very low applied load could cause, cause problems. And so when we're talking about injuries and trying to predict injury or, or prevent injuries, make recommendations, really think back to what an injury is and ask yourself, what types of injuries am I trying to prevent or predict? Because if you go in blindly, it becomes almost impossible. But if you say, okay, I'm dealing with cumulative injuries, and it's a knee injury, it's an, it's an ACL injury, it's an MCL injury. If it's a back, is it a fracture? Is it a disc injury? What type of injuries are we talking about? Because each one has a very different mechanism. And therefore, the prevention methods will also be different. Okay, so really try and understand what we're talking about. And then the other thing is, we can't assume blindly that certain interventions are actually going to make a difference. And so I throw this up here. There was a study done, and we looked at uh, improving people's range of motion. We all hear, you know, flexibility is a risk factor for injury. Everybody's got to become more flexible. But if you do that in isolation, and you don't actually transfer it to something that matters, it's not going to make a difference. So just because somebody has lots of range of motion or lots of mobility, it doesn't mean that they're going to be at a lower risk. It simply means they have more range of motion. That's it. They still might move terribly. They still might be loading their tissues in a way that is going to expose them to higher risk. Movement always matters. But I think it's really, really important, and something that I've come to, is that there are a lot of things that influence the way that we move. Okay? It's not just one thing. We can't look at somebody and say, I know the exact reason why you do what you do or why you perform the way you do. Throw this up. So if I'm squatting or I'm running and I squat and my knees collapse, what causes that? Would anybody suggest maybe it's your glute need? Maybe. Could be lack of awareness. Could be lots of things. Could be your feet. Okay? So I don't have x-ray eyes. I can't see what's going on underneath the skin. So I have no idea why that's happening. All I know is that it is happening. Okay, so when you're watching the way people move, I was guilty of this. I started making assumptions as to what is the underlying cause. And if you do that and you start making recommendations to fix the problem by turning on the glutes, then your, your recommendation could be completely misdirected. When if you say, all I know is I don't want somebody to look like that. I don't want your knees to collapse. I don't want you to round your back. That's all I know. You are rounding your back. I don't want you to. I don't know what's causing it. All I know is that you are doing it. And because you are doing it, therefore you're loading tissues that you don't want to be loaded. Therefore, your risk for injury is probably going up. And if you do that time and time and time again, what habits am I creating? Okay, it's all about habitual movement patterns. You do something seemingly mundane, extended periods of time, eventually that's going to creep its way into lots of other things that you do. Okay, so I started to explore, all right, what are some of the reasons why people move the way that we do? I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the functional movement screen. But we use this uh, simply as a, a measure to test whether or not knowledge of a task changes the way you move. So for those of you who don't know, the FMS is a, a seven-task screen, very, very simple, um, originally intended to just identify painful patterns. Okay? For that purpose, it can be fantastic. But there's other people now trying to use it to predict injury, guide recommendations, all these other things based on a particular score. And so we thought, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to administer the FMS to this group of firefighters. And we're going to use the standardized instructions, you know, tell you exactly what you're supposed to do, have you do the FMS, and then we're going to do it a second time. The second time, I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. So I'm going to tell you, not how you did, but I'm going to tell you what the criteria are to get a perfect score. So nothing else, all I said was, this is exactly what it takes to get a perfect score. And in a matter of about five minutes, we took, so the blue 
columns are individuals pre-score. The red columns are the individuals post-score. We took the group average from 13.6 to 16.3 in five minutes. Just by telling them what the answer was. And so I show this to highlight the fact that there's knowledge of what the test is for can change the way that you move. And so you need to be very careful with what assumptions you're making based on the way somebody looks. So you can't say, you score this way or you look this way, therefore your glutes are weak, or you lack strength, or you lack mobility, you lack flexibility, because you don't know. Maybe they just weren't aware. Maybe they didn't know what you were looking for. And just because they know now what you're, know what you're looking for doesn't mean they actually move any better. It doesn't necessarily mean they're at a less risk for injury. It just means that they performed the task in a way that you wanted them to. That's it. I thought that was pretty powerful. Another question we thought, okay, well, we're dealing with firefighters, police, military. These guys have very demanding lives. And so if we're using very low level tests or low level exercises or activities to evaluate how they move, could we be making other assumptions? So does load change the way that we move? I'm sure everybody in here would probably say, probably. And so we did a study and found, yeah, it does. But the interesting thing was, it wasn't in the same direction for everybody. So what I'm showing here is we have people squatting. So on the left, we have somebody squatting with light load at low speed. Right beside, same individual, high load, low speed. So all we did was increase the load. That individual had a reduced, they showed less spine flexion, so they rounded their back less when the load was higher. So that might say, well, this person could have been aware. So when they perceived the task to be very low risk, they performed it in a way that we wouldn't necessarily perceive to be good. But when the, they thought the risk was higher, they approached it very differently. It had nothing to do with mobility, flexibility, all that stuff. On the contrary, the person on the right here, they went the other way. So with the light load, low speed, they looked great. When load went up, they got worse. And so this might insinuate that the person lacked strength initially, so when the demand was higher, they performed worse. But we don't know. All we know is that load changes the way you move. And in different ways for different people. Same thing is true for speed. So we had same people, just now it's different conditions. So we varied low speed, high speed. So on the left, we have both light load, low speed, high speed. Guy shows less spine flexion with a higher speed. Guy on the right goes the other way. So again, load, speed, knowledge of the criteria that we're looking for, all these things change the way that we move. Another study we did, um, I wanted to know how does somebody's performance on a very low level test, like the FMS, how does that relate to something very job specific, where the demands can be very high. So we had a bunch of firefighters come in again, did the FMS, and then we had simulated a few firefighting tasks. So advancing hose. This individual was one of the best FMS scores I've ever seen. He got a 20. And so from a, a screening standpoint, he moved very, very well. Therefore, based on the, the research that's been done, using a cutoff score of 14, his risk would be perceived as very, very low. But when this guy did the hose advance task, this is what he looked like. So I don't know if you guys can see this with all my arrows here. But look at his knees. So I was reviewing this guy, this guy's uh, data with him afterwards, and I said, oh my God, do, you, do your knees hurt? He said, yeah. You know, every time I run, I'm a soccer player, I gotta wear a brace, because I, I just can't handle it. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. But the crazy thing is, is that when he wasn't challenged with high demands, like something like this, when it was very low level, this didn't appear. 
And so if we're trying to provide or predict injury or make recommendations that are appropriate for this individual to prepare him for his job or his life, we have to consider the demands of the activities. Because if we don't, we can be completely misdirected. Does that make sense? So then, then I started thinking, okay, well, if, I, if I'm a firefighter, if I'm working with firefighters, and the demands really matter, and does that mean that I have to screen every single task a firefighter might perform? Or are there ways that I can use a bunch of general tasks to predict how they might perform some of these firefighting things. But when I say predict, I mean, are there similar motions? So I need to identify some key motions that I'm very interested in that are gonna either increase my risk for injury or limit my performance. And so based on the examples I've shown, this could be something like frontal plane knee motion or spine motion. Okay, so from a performance standpoint, if your knees are collapsing, forces aren't gonna be directly or directed through the joint, therefore performance is gonna go down. If I have lots of spine motion, performance is gonna go down because now I don't have that stiffness to really transfer anything from my lower body to my upper body if I'm pushing or pulling or doing anything up here. Okay, so thinking about spine motion, knee motion. Can I predict how much somebody's gonna have when performing on the job just based on some general tasks? And so what we found is what I'm showing here so in the top left hand corner, it was general tasks, so squatting, lunging, lifting, pushing, and pulling. And they were performed at low loads, and, or yeah, low loads, low speeds. Right here, top right, we have low loads, high speeds. Bottom left, high loads, low speeds. Bottom right, high loads, high speeds. The red lines that you see are limits that I have created by saying what was the maximum spine flexion or frontal plane knee motion you had when performing those general tasks. All the circles in the middle are how much you had when performing the firefighter related tasks. And so this was my way of saying can I use the general tasks to provide boundaries as to how much motion you might exhibit when performing something job specific. And what we found, I was kind of surprised, is that, yeah, you can. And you can see that with the high load, high speed, so the more demanding conditions, it's much, much better. And so this provided some, some insight to say, well, maybe you can be very general if you're using some type of evaluation to predict how somebody might move when performing a job-related skill. So. Just kind of to summarize where my head is at right now with, with evaluating movement or doing some type of movement screen. The first thing is describe the demands of the person's job or their life. Okay, you need to understand what the demands are. You need to provide context to what you're doing. Okay, so one thing you can think about is what are the commonly sustained injuries? Is it a back, is it a knee, is it a shoulder? What motions am I actually worried about or concerned about. Then identify those motions of interest, okay? I was guilty of it. When I first started thinking about this whole movement piece, I got caught up in minutia, okay? I think we can all become very paralyzed when looking at somebody and saying, oh my God, what am I looking at? If we go to the research and say, what do we actually know? Let's look at the big things that limit performance or will increase your risk that are based on evidence. And so I can tell you, Spine motion and knee motion are two great places to start. If we can look at those things, be able to observe those things, be able to try and use those as metrics to guide training, if we could do that with firefighters, military, police, I think we would have a lot of success. Don't get caught up in a whole bunch of other stuff that there's no evidence to support. So identify the motions of interest. And then, when you're screening, Make sure you choose tasks or exercises, if you're gonna do a screen, that actually challenge those motions of interest. If you find that in your population, so for firefighting, a lot of it is, is unilateral or asymmetrical. And so you might be hose on one side, you might be swinging a, a sledgehammer in one direction. So rotation, 
might be something that you're interested in. How well does this individual control rotation? Therefore, if you're doing some type of evaluation, make sure you have them perform a task that challenges that motion. So everything bilateral is not going to do it. Does that make sense? And you're looking at how well can they control the motion, not how much motion do they have. Because I don't care if you have lots of range of motion. I want to know how well you control it. So when I put lots of load on you, or I have you swing really, really quickly, can you control rotation? I want it to be zero. So on that backdrop, what's the role of exercise? So this is where I th what I think is really exciting. All right, all this movement stuff, great, you know, demands matter, prediction. But in here, we're all using exercise as a means to make people better. And so how do we approach exercise on this backdrop? This is kind of where I'm thinking now. If we identify some key features, so again, let's take spine motion, let's take knee motion. And I'm going to try and stabilize those features. I'm going to try and, with exercise, I'm going to try and perturb your movement system. So I'm going to throw loads at you. I'm going to throw speeds at you. I'm going to throw reps and sets, change duration or work to rest ratios. Your goal is to stabilize those key things. So no matter what I throw at you, I want you to control it or stabilize it. So from an injury standpoint, if we know that you know, injuries are going to, for knee injuries, it's going to be associated with a lot of that stuff. So I don't care what exercise or activity I throw at you, or what demands I throw at you, I want you to prevent that from happening. And we're going to do so in a very periodized, progressive manner, but that becomes the target or the metric of interest. Okay? So we're perturbing the movement system, fit principle, frequency, intensity, time, type, in hopes that if we do this, these good patterns are going to transfer and become persistent in life. If we don't do this, and we use exercise as a means to make people more fit, but we don't pay attention to these motions that really, really matter, what could happen is we start creating habits, habitual movement behaviors that emerge and persist in life. But it's an undesired feature. So if we, exercise is a great way to create habits, but if we do so and we don't pay attention to the things that matter, it could start showing up in other things. Therefore, people get injured. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Okay? Exercise is a fantastic means to practice. Practice good movement behaviors. Okay? But what I really want to focus, like, to emphasize is you have to make sure that you're challenging people with loads and speeds. Okay? Movement isn't something that you do here and then it goes away. It's always important. And that could be one of the reasons why a lot of our, our guys and girls are getting hurt while exercising. is because they're trying to become more fit, but they're not paying attention to how they're doing it. So then, you know, I pose the question, what are we doing with all these things here? Are we actually stabilizing undesired features? So yeah, I might be lifting more load. Yeah, I might be moving faster, but at what consequence? What are the implications of this? We can't train in the gym and limit our successes to the gym. If it isn't actually influencing what they do outside the gym, then what are we doing? So to give you guys a, a little background on this, don't just take my word for it. This is kind of the, the philosophy that we had, and we decided to put it to the test. And so we conducted a training study a few years ago um, in collaboration with the Pensacola Fire Department. And so we had, I think there were upwards of 80 guys and girls that volunteered to participate. Uh, we did fitness tests, lab-based testing, simulated firefighting tasks, a bunch of general tasks. Uh, where we actually hooked them up, measured their motion, measured the way their muscles were working. Um, we mimic our, our fitness test was very similar to uh, the WFI 
assessment uh, that's promoted by the, the IFF. Uh, we added a couple additional strength and power tests, uh, but very extensive. Um, from there, we separated the firefighters into three training or three groups, two interventions and one control group. The one training group, which I've uh, here called fitness, the sole purpose was to make these guys as fit as possible. So it was a 12-week training protocol, periodized, um, you know, a pretty decent program. But the coach, so both programs were coached. Um, the coach was told not to emphasize um, the transfer of training. The coach wasn't was told not to really try and stabilize some of these key features, like spine motion, knee motion. Okay, the sole purpose was to get these guys as fit as possible. He wasn't willing to sacrifice form, so we didn't want injuries happening in the gym. Um, but the emphasis wasn't on the transfer of training. The other group, which I've called movement, same emphasis from a fitness perspective. Okay? These guys are firefighters. We have to prepare them for the demands of their lives. So we need to make sure we're getting people more fit. But we're going to do so by paying attention to how they move. And we're going to do so by emphasizing these key features in whatever exercise they're performing in hopes that we get some type of transfer to things they're not performing while training. Okay, So it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm going to change the way you move doing an exercise. But I showed you with the FMS study, you can change the way somebody moves in four minutes just by telling them what you, you want them to look for. So we wanted to know, does this change your ability or awareness to perform something you don't perform while exercising? Okay. The coaches were blind to what we were doing in the lab, so they had no knowledge of that. The firefighters didn't know the differences between the training groups, and so everybody was, everybody was kind of blind to what was go going on. Uh, myself and the colleague that were doing the lab-based testing, we had nothing to do with training. So after 12 weeks, we brought everybody back, um, and we did the test again. So we retested them with fitness, we retested them on all the lab-based tests. So this is just kind of highlighting um, some of the stuff that was done, fitness-wise, and then some of the lab-based uh, tasks, both general, firefighting-specific. Um, for those of you who are interested, when you download the, 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 uh, the presentation, this is an example of one day for the fitness training group. So like I said, it was periodized. So there were three phases in the fitness training program. Uh, three different days. The movement-oriented fitness training group, same type of thing. So periodized, this one actually had four phases, um, but same type of protocol. So what do we find? Well, in terms of fitness, both fitness groups got more fit, or both training groups got more fit, which is great. Our control group didn't, which is also great. They actually acted as a control group. Um, there were slight I guess, improve, or further improvements in the fitness group, but nothing was significant. Okay, so really, both training groups got more fit. That's kind of the story from a, a fitness standpoint. So we did, you know, body comp, treadmill time. We did the gherkin with these guys. I think the, the average gherkin increase was like a minute and a half after 12 weeks. Um, like, some of these fitness improvements were pretty substantial. Uh, push-ups, like 25 more push-ups post-training, holding a front plank for an extra minute and a half. Like, it was pretty impressive how you know, fit these guys got. But that's not the whole story. So post-training, pre-training, post-training. We tested these guys, so some general tasks that weren't performed in training. Squat variation, lunge variation, lift, push, and pull, unilateral. And we did these at... Uh, like I showed you before, multiple loads and speeds. So low load, low speed, up to high load, high speed. What I'm showing here, this is squat pattern changes. The blue columns are the movement group. Red columns are the fitness group. Yellow columns are control. Anything above zero means that there was less spine or knee motion post-training. So we have spine flexion is the first 
and we have left knee or frontal plane knee motion and then right frontal plane knee motion. So again, positive means they had less motion post-training, so less flexion post-training. Um, negative means they had more. And so what first jumps out at me here is the massive negative for the red for spine flexion. This means that those individuals that received the fitness-oriented training actually exhibited more spine flexion post-training across all loads and speeds when squatting. So yeah, they got more fit, but for some reason, they also exhibited more of that undesirable motion, which might predispose them to injury. And that wasn't apparent in the movement group. What we also saw is when we're looking at this knee motion on the right side, it was the opposite. So the movement train group actually had less knee motion post-training, and the fitness group didn't really change. And this wasn't just for squatting. Lunging. We see something very strange going on for the control group, but it all went the other way, so it all was negative. For the fitness training group, we do see some positives. So right now we have spine flexion on the left. We have lateral bend, which is the second four. We have twist, the third four, and then it was a right side lunge, so we have right frontal plane knee motion. So the fitness group actually exhibited less lateral bend and less twist post-training, but they also showed more spine flexion and more frontal plane knee motion. Movement train group, not the same thing. So they had less lateral bend, less rotation, and they also showed a very interesting speed response for flexion. So you see on this left-hand side that there's only two bars that are going up. That's only when the, the speed was fast. So low load, high speed, high load, high speed. So they only showed less flexion when the speed was high. Lifting, same thing. Less spine flexion post-training in the movement group. Fitness didn't change. Pushing, same thing. Fitness group, some decrease, some increase. But overall, you know, they may have predisposed themselves to further injury by exhibiting more of this undesirable motion post-training. Movement group, not so much. And then pulling was very similar. So, some recommendations or thoughts from this, this training intervention. Guides for future recommendations. When we're training, Really identify the motions of interest. What are those things that are either going to increase my risk for injury or limit my performance? And then use exercise to try and stabilize those things. Okay? Use all the knowledge that you have of periodization and progression. Use the FIT principles. Perturb their system with all these different things. But try and control those motions of interest. You want those things to emerge and persist in everything else they do outside the gym. You don't want it to be limited to an exercise they're performing um, in the gym. Use movement to guide your progression. Don't, use, don't necessarily use loads. So just because the program says you have to perform 80% you know, of your 1RM and next week you're jumping up to 85, if the person if the person's movement patterns degrade, don't do it. Just think about what the implications are. Not only might you hurt them in the gym, but what habits are you creating? When they go and perform a job-related skill, or they're at home performing something, maybe a mundane task, what habits have you created in the gym that are going to transfer? Which of these key features are actually going to emerge in their life now? Okay, really think about what you're doing with exercise. Why are you having this person do this exercise or do this activity? And what are the implications if you don't do it in a way that is going to cause a positive response? I think one of the big take-homes and that might support some of the evidence that's out there is emphasizing fitness alone 
may not increase or reduce your risk for injury. We have to be smarter. Ask yourself, am I making somebody tired or am I making somebody better? It's our job to make people better and not just in the gym. And just a last point, really view exercises as tools and that's it. Don't become married to an exercise. There's lots of ways to accomplish the same thing. Okay, have a rationale for doing what you're doing. Know what you're trying to accomplish. If it's for firefighters, we wanna improve these guys' performance. We wanna reduce their risk for injury. What injuries are we talking about? What motions are associated with those injuries? What motions do we actually wanna stabilize and make really, really robust? What are the demands associated with these activities that they're performing? Therefore, what are the demands that we have to eventually get to in training? Don't just blindly throw a bunch of stuff at them and hope it transfers. It doesn't work that way. There's evidence to say it doesn't. So we can be a lot smarter in our approach. So just train with a purpose. Make exercise matter in life. And then just uh, in summary, kind of what I've been saying is we're preparing for life. It's not about exercise. Exercise is a tool to get us there, but it's just one tool. And like was mentioned earlier today, when we're working with these type of populations, maybe the emphasis goes on the implications in life. Maybe it, it shouldn't just be about the job. Maybe we should really get them thinking about how this impacts everything else you do when you go home from work. Because if we do that, maybe they'll get buy-in a little bit more and actually want to make a change. I think that's it. Thank you.